hey, check this out. Look at this tiny 46 computer I built. And this is not emulation with a Raspberry Pi or anything like that. This is the real deal, an Intel 486DX4 100 megahertz. For comparison, this is a normal Mini Tower ATK, so you have a better idea of how small this thing is. So stick around to see how I built this computer and what it can do. So let's go. This all started around March 2021. I wanted to build a tiny retro computer, ideally with new parts using something like a Raspberry Pi or the Mr. Project, so we could stay working for a long time and be easy to fix in case something broke. That was until I watched the Scanlines video where he put together a 486 computer with an ISA SBC on a backplane with three ISA slots. That gave me the idea to do something similar, but I would also design and 3D print a mini monitor and a mini case. Sure, I would lose the new hardware for longevity angle, but what I would gain in terms of compatibility from having a real 486 sounded like a good trade-off for me. And man, how cool would it be to have a tiny 486 computer? So I bought myself an SBC that came with an Intel 486DX4 100MHz and 32MB of VDO memory. To go with that, I also got a 4 ISA slot backplane which I can plug the SBC onto alongside a few expansion cards. Specifically, a Tseng Lab ZT4000 graphics card, an ESS Audio Drive ES1868F sound card, which is small and seems to have good compatibility with stuff that uses Sound Blaster cards. And finally, an SMC Ethernet card so I can easily transfer files to the computer and also connect to the internet. The first thing I started designing was the monitor, because that would be the same regardless of what I decided to do with the computer. For that, I got this 7-inch 4x3 LCD display that has a native resolution of 800x600 from AliExpress. 800x600 is a good resolution for the operating systems that I'm planning to run on this computer, and this display can probably scale lower resolutions fairly decently. I had to make a couple of mods to the LCD screen though. The first one was to extend the backlight wire a bit because it wasn't able to reach the main board mounted on the back of the monitor. I also needed to change the power LED from a surface mounted one to a conventional one so that I could mount it to the front of the monitor. After that I was off to assembling it, which I started with the LCD assembly. To protect the screen, a friend of mine helped me laser cut this piece of acrylic. Now we can put together the controls button assembly. And here it is. Now the board assembly. This is the only part that I had to super glue. This is what keeps the base from coming out. It'll make more sense later. I decided to disconnect the cables here so I could screw the back of the monitor without having to move the front around. After reconnecting them, we can finally close the monitor. And now we can assemble the base! I had to remove this screw because I didn't realize I wouldn't be able to install the base with it there. Now I just have to slide that in and here it is, my tiny monitor, which is designed after the Samsung Sync Master 3, which is a monitor that I used to have when I was younger. Now onto the actual computer, which is a whole can of worms in itself. So as I said before, backplane, card, 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 and SBC. And that's the main bulk of the computer. But I need a few more things as well. An SD to IDE adapter, which will act as our hard drive the good old GoTech floppy disk emulator, a Pico PSU to power this thing up, and originally I wanted to use one of these slim laptop CD-ROM drives inside of the computer, but I couldn't get them to work with the SBC, probably because neither of them or the SD to IDE adapter have master slave selectors. And I tried quite a few of them, including SATA ones.
So after giving up on that, I designed this little PCB that allows me to have an IDE connector on the back of the computer so I can connect a normal CD-ROM drive to it later. I also had to modify the GoTech floppy emulator so I could install it properly inside of the computer. In that process, I also ended up designing this little PCB that will allow me to expose the GoTech USB port in front of the case. Another thing that I had to modify was the PSU as it was originally an ITX one. So I soldered the AT connectors directly to it because using adapters would take too much space. Then I just needed to finish the case design, 3D print it, and... Man, in the beginning I was so confident I could design and build this thing with very few iterations. I'm sorry, Earth. Anyway, let's finally start building this thing. And we're gonna start with a five and a quarter inch floppy drive as it has one of the coolest features you'll see on this computer. It has this little port that you can open to reveal the SD card slot for the SD2 IDE adapter and the USB port for the GoTech floppy disk emulator. This is so cool. Now the 3.5 inch floppy drive. The LEDs of both drives will also be connected to the GoTech to provide floppy activity status. In hindsight, this was a bit of a mistake though because the GoTech doesn't have enough power to drive both LEDs, so they ended up being very dim as you'll see later. Now we can assemble the front control panel which will have the hard drive activity and power LEDs, the power button, the reset button, the key lock, and what would be the megahertz display is the display from the GoTech to indicate which floppy disk you're using at the moment. My friend also helped me laser cut this acrylic cover for the panel with labels for each button, LED, and display so it looks more authentic. Now we can move to the front of the case where we're gonna install the things that we just built. And here it is, it looks so great. Now let's move on to the back of the case. This is where the CD-ROM ID connector goes. And this is the power connector that we are attaching now. Now we can install the front panel to the base, but I had to momentarily remove the five and a quarter inch floppy drive, otherwise I can't screw the panel to the base. The order of the cards here kind of matter, otherwise things won't fit here properly. If you have been watching my videos, this is that not to offend that I originally got from a custom Dreamcast, which didn't work because it's 12 volts. I'm glad I found another use for it. 
conveniently, this back plane has these terminals where I can connect the fan to. That's good because I don't have to install a Molex connector to it, which would take a lot of space. Now let's apply some thermal paste, which is completely unnecessary on the CPU, and install the fan. Then we can move on to the installation of the GoTech. Now I'm going to connect the front panel stuff to the SBC. Figuring out where to connect these things was rough because it's hard to find information about these industrial SBCs. Luckily we have the Volgans forums, which helped me a lot in finding that information. After all of that, we can start closing the case. Keeping the wires out of the way is actually harder than it looks. And here's the thing completely assembled. As a final touch, I'll add these adhesive feet to it. And now we can install some software on it, which the first one will be Windows 95. I will need a CD though, because this box comes with floppy disks only. To be able to use this CD, we'll need a CD drive, and this is where the IDE port that I put on the back of the computer comes in. Now we just need to insert the SD card that will act as our hard drive, and put in the flash drive with the floppy disk images so I can boot the computer. After that we can just turn the computer on, put the CD in, and now we're ready to install the operating system. As tradition, with any new Windows installation, I have to finish one solitaire game. And here we have Windows with all of its drivers and the software that I want to show installed. The image from the monitor isn't as good in the video as it is in real life because filming it is kinda hard as this LCD doesn't have the best viewing angles and getting rid of the more pattern without losing focus completely is really hard. So bear with me a little bit here. Alright, now that we are on the desktop, let's first go to the system properties. And as you can see here, it's an 8486 with 32 megabytes of RAM. I honestly thought this would show Intel 486 or whatever, but that's okay. The first thing I want to try here is a fairly light game, Lemmings Paintball. And performance is kinda crap. That's because of the Tsangit T4000 graphics card. This card can actually do 16-bit color at 800 by 600 and 1024 by 768 at 256 colors. But I have it here at 800 by 600 with 256 colors and even then it's still pretty slow. I mean that's not surprising given it's a very old ISA card. A classic game that I needed to try as well was SimCity 2000, but the situation here isn't much better. If you zoom in, it's kinda sorta playable, but it's not a pleasant experience. I really wanted a graphics card that can run Windows better, but an ISA card that can do that, like the ATI Match 64, is going for insane prices on eBay right now. Another thing that I also tried was to play an MP3 on Winamp, but that was super choppy. Maybe it's because the bitrate is high and maybe a smaller bitrate would work better, but I mean, this is a 486, it clearly wasn't made for this. I tried a MIDI file though and it is better, probably because the sound card is doing most of the work. MIDI files do play better Windows Media Player though as Winamp is a bit too heavy for this computer, but it's still cool seeing it working, even if it's crap. 
However, one thing that works surprisingly well all things considered is internet browsing. Even if websites load slowly because this ethernet card is very old and I'm pretty sure it can only do 10 megabits per second. Here's my website. Scrolling is pretty okay actually. Browsing websites on the old net works pretty well too. Here's the Nintendo website from 1996. I find it fascinating that they had the actual specs of the Game Boy on the website. It's not as common for companies to put the full specs of their products on their websites anymore. Alright, now, with the SD to IDE adapter, we can easily swap operating systems. Here's another SD card with MS-DOS 6.22 and Windows 3.11 installed. Windows 3.11 runs a bit better than Windows 95, but not by a lot. Here's one of my favorite games of all time, Sim Tower. It is playable, but the audio is a bit choppy. Man, I love this game so much. A game that runs pretty well though is Key Free. I mean, it's not a graphically demanding game at all, but it is a classic. Browsing the web here is not too different from Windows 95. Here's Oda Vista. Let's click on a website here. And yeah, it works pretty well. On DOS though is where this computer shines, especially with 2D games. Here's my favorite game of all time, Lemmings. Unsurprisingly, it runs incredibly well. Level 3 is fun because we get to explode them. Classic. Here's another game that I really love, Sky Roads. One thing that is kind of annoying with this monitor is that it doesn't save the settings for all resolutions. So very frequently I have to do the auto config to frame the image again. But here we go, the game runs pretty well. A game that runs surprisingly well, considering the full screen animations, is The Dig. They are resourceful, widely educated, and creative thinkers. So that's like and I have no reason to think that other LucasArts adventure games wouldn't work well. But that's pretty much it. This video took me a long time to make for various reasons. The computer itself took me over a year and a half because I was working on other projects at the same time. And I was constantly having issues with the multiple 3D printers I tried. And the video itself took me another 6 months or so for various personal reasons. But I think the final result is pretty cool. I now have the tiniest 486 tower that at the same time is super practical and I can use it even if I'm in a situation where I have very little space. Even if it's not the most versatile computer like my Pentium MMX. That's why, in my opinion, the Pentium MMX with PCI graphics cards is the sweet spot in terms of DOS and Windows retro computing. But let's not get into that tangent right now. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to press the like button and leave a comment. And if you like content related to retro gaming, retro computing, old tech, and other tangentially related subjects, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.